Hi, my name is Mark West. I'm an education specialist at UNESCO. I work at our headquarters here in Paris, France. I research digital learning and the future of education. I also was uh, an author of the EdTech Tragedy publication UNESCO released in September 2023. The pandemic was this unprecedented period when almost the entire school population depended on remote and digital learning. We estimate that up to 1.6 billion learners were out of school and again, reliant on some form of connected technology to learn. So the book is really an examination of what occurred during this unprecedented period. In some contexts, this period was fairly short-lived, lasted only four, even six weeks. But in other places, this was a very prolonged experience, lasting up to two full academic years, and in rare contexts, even longer. So we wanted to understand what occurred when education was completely reliant on digital technologies, and basically, connected technologies became the backbone of education. An EdTech tragedy uses the metaphor of a tragedy to structure the organization of a, of a very long book. Tragedies often begin with hubris and ambition. This was no different for the EdTech tragedy that we recount, this shift to fully remote digital learning during the COVID-19 pandemic that people have somewhat forgotten. But at the beginning of the pandemic, there was this very optimistic discourse that technology was going to supplant schools, that schools were outdated in a digital age, that personalized learning trajectories through digital devices were the way of the future. We look at this sort of very enthusiastic, optimistic discourse that existed prior to the pandemic, and that is uh, frames, I think, a lot of what happened during the pandemic and explains the intense reliance on digital technologies. The second act of the book is what happened. This is the drama, if you will, of the, of the EdTech tragedy. We fly across the world, take readers to various contexts, and really show what happened when educational technologies became the backbone of teaching and learning. We look at dimensions of inclusion, access, quality, we also look at issues of privatization, surveillance and control, the gender aspects of this. And we show that there were many unintended and undesirable consequences as a result of the turn to ed tech that we feel have been underappreciated uh, during the pandemic and also after the pandemic. Finally, the book is, ends with an act three, and this is where the lessons to be taken away are, are parked. So this is where we make recommendations and what can we learn from this experience to chart new directions for the digital changes that are occurring with education. There is also in between Act 2 and Act 3, there is an interact section where we deal with some other alternate possibilities. What options were there beyond technology? And this is where we look at approaches that were not so technology reliant that probably could have been more inclusive and more equitable. There was a focus on ed tech because of what we call technology solutionism. And that's this idea that technology can sort of be swooped in or parachuted in to solve very complex problems. We like to often think of technology as being a panacea, something that's going to rescue us from our problems. In the book, we talk about how visions of the schools being replaced by technology are not as new as many people think. The book includes a quote from Thomas Edison in 1913, saying that the motion picture machine that he had invented would make schools uh, redundant and relics of a past age. Again, this was over a hundred years ago, and now we hear this sort of discourse around AI. There is always this sort of idea that technology will bring us into some sort of educational utopia, um, and that perpetually doesn't play out. We know that implementations of technology tend to introduce new risks, and we saw that during the COVID-19 pandemic with issues around privatization of education, uh, surveillance and control of education, uh, teachers and students uh, feeling that they were sort of losing control, and we need to sort of be prepared for that. But we need to stop this pattern of sort of expecting everything all at once from technology and be a little more humble about what it might uh, achieve. When education crossed a digital line, 
sort of everything became privatized. Your connection to uh, the internet, the platforms that people use were almost always private. For example, those were platforms such as uh, Zoom to allow for synchronous classes. But then we look at even the software that students used in those digital spaces. Those were also sort of all of them were uh, privatized as well. Now we can contrast this with the typical uh, scenario of in-person learning. With in-person learning, that is largely public and free, meaning that in many countries, transportation to and from school is provided uh, free of charge or is, is very much subsidized by the state. Um, and then inside the school itself, that's a public space. It's a sort of commons where um, students are able to teach and learn. When education crosses this digital line, it is sort of moving into a very sort of privatized and, and, and for-profit space. That need not be the case. This is concerning because at UNESCO, we consider education to be a human right. It's not something that exists according to market logics. It's something that is meant to be guaranteed for all people and freely available to them. So relying on all of these uh, profit-driven companies to provision that means that education uh, happens according to means. People with um, resources and income can afford better education and people without those resources will not be able to afford that same quality of education. On the surveillance and control aspect, I think this is something that has not been looked at enough. Moving an educational exchange into a digital space means that it is captured, it is recorded in some way. And when you record educational exchange, it means it's easy to retrieve. It's easy to tag to people's names. So it was this case of people became sort of locked up. I'm speaking to you right now on camera. The stakes are much higher when we're speaking on camera and are recorded. We need to be more careful about what we say. Learning requires safe spaces where people can speak freely. They can ask questions that maybe they may even come to regret. Students were participating in Zoom meetings. Those Zoom meetings were often recorded. They were put on cloud platforms that were not very well protected. Uh, they were tagged to student names and other identifying material. So that aspect of the sort of surveillance around education can change and, and make the educational exchange less free, less open, can make people lock up a bit and be afraid to, to make comments, to ask questions, to, to question the status quo. During the pandemic, very young learners were often asked to participate in digital classes. This is problematic for a number of reasons. First is problematic because very young learners, screen-based experiences are not recommended at all. Uh, screen-based experiences can be harmful for their learning and development. Uh, WHO recommendations for screen time for learners under the age of three is zero. For learners under the age of five, it's preferably no time at all, but if there is some time, it's supposed to be very uh, minimal. During the pandemic, we saw things like digital kindergartens became a, a sort of reality. Uh, this was an oxymoron. Kindergarten is something that was widely considered undigitizable. It's uh, it, very young students are get to interaction and other things in the physical world and interacting with peers and touching things and using their various you know sensory organs and kind of coming into the world. When that experience became screen based and virtual. Um, it, it fundamentally changed what education was able to offer. Um, there were many cases of students as young as six, seven, eight years old being expected to follow up to six hours of digital classes a day. Uh, that far surpasses screen time recommendations for that uh, age cohort. But not only is it not helpful, it's harmful to their learning and to their development. You even take something like uh, reading there's a lot of evidence to show that learning to read on paper is much more effective than learning to read on a screen, that we read differently when we read on a screen. And for people who enjoy reading novels and other things, that ability to sort of get lost in, in the world of, of literature and the, the world of words really requires a distraction-free environment. A screen is not a distraction-free environment. 
Um, and so we see a lot of the sort of stilted reading, what people will call tabular reading, which is sort of your eyes are just sort of scanning the page and you're not really deeply reading. So these all have educational implications that I think were underappreciated during the pandemic. But uh, the good news is we're beginning to appreciate them more as we see the sort of impact of what all this digital learning, uh, what the impact has been on, on achievement, on learning on literacy, and I think uh, education systems are beginning to rethink uh, their approaches and the reliance on digital technologies. Our book looks also at the environmental impacts of ed tech. Uh, this is something that is often not discussed, or if it is discussed, it's discussed as ed tech is a sort of greening technology. It's fantastic because we don't need to use as much paper. And isn't that, isn't that great? We aren't uh, printing off reams of copies or relying on these big, heavy uh, paper textbooks that required cutting down of trees and other resources. The book observes that, in fact, intense reliance on digital technologies means reliance on hardware, computer hardware, tablets, mobile phones, uh, laptop computers, PCs, and other things. These are very energy inten intensive to make. They require, they're assembled from non-renewable materials. Many of those materials are toxic. We look at what the implications are if we really are to move towards a world where every single student in the world has, say, a laptop computer or a tablet or both. Um, the implications are head spinning. Uh, it would mean increasing uh, the number of mines on Earth so that these materials could be fabricated. It would require intensive amounts of energy, intensive amounts of water to produce all of these different devices. At UNESCO, we're looking for solutions to make education sustainable. Um, and we continue to move in directions that are not sustainable. And so we need to really think about if we're going to have this intense reliance on digital technology, where will this digital technology come from? How will this digital technology be reused and recycled? Uh, right now, um, e-waste, it's the largest growing stream of trash in the world. And uh, just a little, a little fact that surprises some people, the amount of e-waste that was produced in uh, just before the pandemic, for the, the last figure that data was available, uh, surpassed the weight of all people in Europe combined. That was one year's production of e-waste, just to give you a sense of the sort of scale of the waste. We observed that while EdTech may provide educational solutions to students and learners in very privileged places, in other parts of the world, that can mean increases in child labor and other things. So it's really about looking at the sort of the full scope of this. And our book tries to put some of this uh, into, into perspective and to encourage education systems to develop real plans about how will these devices be uh, provisioned, uh, procured, and to ensure that those come from, you know, sustainable sort of sourcing. Our book looks a lot at what happened um, when students were reliant on digital technology in terms of engagement, uh, in terms of time spent learning, uh, and in terms of um, drop off uh, from education and drop out of education. It shows that engagement almost across the board fell off a cliff, decreased uh, immensely, that the despite the promise of digital technology to enable this sort of freer learning, uh, more engaging learning, most students and teachers found it to be uh, just the opposite, that it was not nearly as engaging or enlivening as an in-person school-based experience. Um, I don't think that was surprising to us because um, education is about learning to move inside communities of other people. And when you're just sitting at home learning from a digital device, that's a very sort of isolating experience. And that was experienced by many people. Isolation and dislocation uh, were common complaints and even maladies during the pandemic. Uh, loneliness spiked, depression spiked. We saw these things. Those can't all be put at the foot of, of ed tech and ed tech modes of learning. But when uh, young people were interviewed, they said that the inability to interact with their peers and teachers at schools 
uh, was making them feel uh, very isolated. A lesson to come out of this is that schools and in-person learning serve many functions. We tend to think of those functions as only making progress in academic and curricular areas, that you're making progress in mathematics or in science or in reading. But in fact, a school-based experience is about learning to deal with peers. It's about having conversations face to face. It's, uh, it's about using your body, whether that's through physical education or other things. Um, it is even about nutrition and health. We saw that when schools closed, uh, many students were malnourished who were depending on, on schools uh, for, for nutrition. And in other contexts uh, where there was um, wealthy countries, we often even saw obesity become a problem during the pandemic because school was a place of exercise for many young people and when those shut down. One positive realization to come out of this experience is that schools are serving lots of different functions. It's not just about making progress in sort of course subjects, but there are these other functions about acculturation, you know, coming into learning to deal with a community of peers that have been underappreciated, and I think after the pandemic are, are, are rightfully being more appreciated. COVID-19 experience was such that we must draw lessons from, from this. We cannot simply sort of forget it, and that's what I see a lot of, is people just wanting to sort of, that was in the past, that was a bad experience, let's not really look back at that. But if you want to talk about the future of digital learning, we, we must look to what occurred during this intense reliance on these technologies. A primary recommendation in the book is that schooling is really important to education, to learning and development. Schooling as an in-person experience, not just sitting in front of a screen at home following academic content, but actually getting yourself up off of a chair and coming into this sort of community of others, learning to deal with others outside of your family. Uh, this is very important for language learning, for acculturation, so many uh, different functions. We recommend that states get serious about guaranteeing the right to schooling. During the COVID-19 pandemic, many people said that states were not upholding their right to education. And states often turned around and said, in fact, we are because we are provisioning you content that can be accessed remotely. The legal architecture around the right to education was formulated in a pre-digital era. So there is nothing usually in the law that says that, that education must be a school-based experience. We hope that going forward, people will make an effort to guarantee that uh, the right to education entails the right to schooling. I'm quite worried about this going forward because many states that are very under-resourced, this can be a solution is to just put content on the cloud and say that, you know, we have fulfilled our right to education and it's up to you, the learner, uh, to go find that content and to follow that content. And I think that would be a very sad day for education if that is sort of the, the educational norm um, and indeed, in some places, at least during the pandemic, for up to two years, that did that was the norm to just follow this. So we have we have seen this become normalized. This what at the time was an unusual learning paradigm has been sort of normalized, and we may see a lot more of it in the future. So we hope that um, education systems get serious about guaranteeing the right to in-person uh, lived experience with schooling. Another finding from our research is that around the world, there were students who were connected, they had good digital skills, and they were not able to find learning content aligned with their curriculum. It was not clear where they should go to further their educational journey, to make uh, curricular progress. That's very unfortunate because those learners in many ways were privileged. Lots of learners did not have connectivity. They were locked out of digital, digital learning. Lots of learners did not have the skills and competencies needed to use digital technology for educational purposes. But for those learners who had those two key things, 
they were often missing good quality content. That's very surprising in a digital and internet era. So one of UNESCO's key recommendations from this experience is to work with countries to assure that learners understand where they can go online if they need some help with mathematics, if they need help in reading, if they need help in science, if they need help in history. It should be very clear where they can go to get good quality digital learning content. That was not at all clear during the pandemic, and it meant that families and teachers were having to sort of build these very ad hoc solutions. You know, check out this YouTube video over here, look at this other piece of content here. If you can afford a subscription to this EdTech utility, it's quite useful. You can look at this other platform that shows you a lot of personalized advertising. That's unfortunate. This is one reason UNESCO, in cooperation with UNICEF, has launched the Gateways to Public Digital Learning Initiative, which is all about helping to ensure there are public digital learning platforms that are easy to find, easy to navigate, and hold good quality learning content. When you call a book an EdTech tragedy, you, you need to be prepared to explain alternatives to digital technology. That's people's sort of first question when you say that this intense reliance on connected technologies during the pandemic uh, might have been an EdTech tragedy. People will say, well, what else was there? That, you know, here we have these global lockdowns. There, of course, was a desire to keep learning moving. What other alternatives could there possibly have been? The book deals with this question directly. Uh, we identify a number of different approaches. One observation is to not place so much reliance exclusively on digital technology. There were select instances where um, putting out physical learning activities proved to be very successful. For very young learners, this could sometimes just mean a set of crayons, paper, uh, paints, clay that's, that young learners could shape. A kit like that can be more engaging for very young learners than the, than, than the most sophisticated uh, applications or virtual reality uh, solutions or other things. So for very young learners, that was often just a matter of, you know, integrating art supplies or toys or other things that students could pass time in the home. And a lot of times in very under-resourced communities, those, those were not in place. Um, instead, we saw instances to try and get tablet computers in those sorts of environments. Um, and often inside the home, they didn't have Wi-Fi connections. They didn't have easy means to power the devices. So reliance on ed tech in very under-resourced uh, communities often defied uh, common sense. So more reliance on you know, lower tech solutions could have been very educative and in some contexts was. A final sort of solution, and this gets into sort of controversial waters, but is was to reopen schools sooner. And we saw around the world enormous variation in how long uh, schools were closed. In some contexts, schools closed up to uh, up to two full academic years. In other contexts, just closed for a few uh, weeks. Another alternative to intense reliance on digital technologies was uh, to pause education. This again is a sort of controversial approach, but in contexts where it is known that fewer than 10% of learners have any possibility of accessing remote digital learning, a pause maybe made sense. A pause means it's just a simple admission that schools are closed, education is stopped, and we will resume education when schools reopen. We look at some instances where countries uh, in Africa did attempt this, a uh, country in South America as well, um, and it uh, had different levels of success. In both cases, there was enormous pressure on the country to sort of try to support some type of, of uh, distance and remote learning and to, to step away from that sort of pause. So I think that in places where there's very limited connectivity, very limited access to di digital devices, and frankly, no realistic way for a majority of learners to follow education, a more equitable approach 
would be a pause. I think one of the more interesting arguments made in the book is to, in, to indulge this thought experiment. What if the COVID-19 pandemic had happened in a pre-digital age? and say 1980, before there was internet connected technologies or at least wide ownership of internet connected technologies. And we look at this and, and ask, would the school closures have been as long? And I think it's fair to observe that in many contexts, there was an understanding that education was being taken care of even though schools were closed. A major development we saw during the pandemic and after the pandemic is that EdTech found a new sort of rationale. And that rationale was one of increasing educational resilience. The prior to the pandemic, EdTech was sold on, it's going to make education more effective. It's going to improve student learning outcomes. It's going to make education more engaging and exciting for learners. But during the pandemic, the sort of the selling point for EdTech was you have to have it because it's going to make education resilient. EdTech, especially internet connected technology, it requires all sorts of things and has all sorts of points of failure. It requires electricity, which learners and families around the world do not have. It requires internet connectivity, which learners and families around the world either do not have or cannot afford. It requires various types of hardware. It requires various types of software. It requires various types of licenses. During the pandemic, we saw the way these, these could break down. Hardware fails, software stops working, your connectivity cuts out, your uh, mobile credits uh, run out. So there are all these different ways that this can break down we observed that what is actually highly resilient is a, is a school down the street. That's something that can work uh, with or without electricity. It's something that, uh, you know, has, has proven resilient even in, in often in times of, of crisis, times of conflict, times of even, uh, you know, weather disasters and other things that education has been able to continue in this sort of way. We further observed that when it comes to questions of resilience, when education is totally reliant on digital devices, it uh, has opened itself up to new forms of attack. Um, malware is commonly targeted at uh, educational institutions, at learners, at teachers. Uh, Microsoft, that keeps the best global data on malware attacks, uh, published data to show that there are more malware attacks aimed at the education sector than every other sector combined. So while there are many ways that EdTech can increase educational resilience, there are also many factors that EdTech makes education indeed more fragile and more brittle. And our book sort of pushes back against this impulse that yes, EdTech is a pillar of educational resilience, and instead, we say it's more complicated than that. And singular or intense reliance on EdTech in many ways can make education more fragile than what we think of as traditional sort of school-based education with, with major offline and in-person experiences.